velocity has no component cos 90 degree will be zero so you will know that for a person in the river who has not started his boat will be moving with the flow of the river and for that person uh, it will the river will look like uh, like still water and uh, the ground will be appear to be moving in opposite direction so for that person uh, the speed of everything will be that speed uh, which is in still water so this mirror must have gone through this point also so from this point to that point some time has must have elapsed and consider that this time is t2 so this must be v into t2 so the time taken by light ray to read to go from the m to m2 and then return from m2 to m is t2 so in that time interval um, this uh, interferometer is at rest with respect to earth but with respect to ether this interferometer is moving in this direction so the mirror must have moved some distance in ether and consider that the time taken by the light to return from here to there is t2 so this mirror has must have moved this distance v into t2 because the velocity of this uh, this velocity is the velocity of ether which is actually the velocity of earth so uh, we have cal we know that this distance is v t2 now this length is l2 now the beam of light from this m mirror is going with a speed c so why this is going with with c so we as we have already discussed someone who is at rest with respect to the river someone who has put his engine off the boat engine of the boat off will be flowing in the river with the speed of river so someone who is at rest with respect to ether with re or with respect to ether so some person who is at rest with respect to ether will see everything moving with their uh, usual speed that is uh, uh, the the person who is who has put the engine of the boat in off condition will see that all the boats which are moving in the river are moving uh, as such they are moving in still water so they can move in any direction but they must move with their usual speed which is v suppose the uh, suppose that the boat moves in a still water with a speed v so ground observer will see that it can move faster or lesser uh, depending on the direction in which uh, it, it is moving with respect to river for upstream it will be slower and for downstream it will be moving faster with respect to the ground observer but for an observer who is in a boat which is at rest who has put the engine of the boat in rest condition so who has not started the engine of the boat will see that everything is moving like uh, they are moving in still water so they can move in any direction with their usual speed in still water so we know that light moves with a speed c so for, with respect to ether it must be moving with a speed c so that's why we have discussed these things so it is going in this direction with a speed c and returning with c here no special relativity has been used you can say that uh, the speed of light is same in all direction for all inertial observers we are not using that fact we are using that simple fact that someone who is at rest with respect to river will uh, see everybody moving in such a way that they are moving in still water so that kind of situation can be applied here someone who is at rest is actually moving with the speed of ether 
with respect to earth so he will be at rest uh, with respect to ether and see that every one will uh, every beam of light whether it goes in any direction is moving with a speed c so uh, the time the time taken by uh, we can apply pythagoras theorem here so you can see that the time taken in moving from here to here must be t2 upon 2 so v t2 upon 2 is this distance squared will be equal to l2 square plus uh, no plus this distance is squared plus l2 is square must be equal to the distance moved by light in vt2 time will be c into t2 by c into t2 upon 2 this is this distance is c into t2 upon 2 because light is moving from this point to that point and the time taken is t2 upon 2 so this must be c t2 upon 2 whole square now from this we will calculate the value of t2 so c square upon 4 minus v square upon 4 uh, just take it in the right hand side and you will get the term t2 square is equal to l2 square so we have t2 is equal to this 4 will be here 4 l2 square upon this c square minus v square in square roots so you have t2 calculated as 2 l2 upon now again we will take out the c square term so if you take out the c square term from the square root it will become c and it will be 1 minus v square upon c square so we have calculated the time taken from by the ray of light in going from m to m1 and returning from that which is t1 and the time taken by the beam of light from going to this point to m2 and returning again to this point which is t2 so these two times there can be some difference in these two time intervals so we will subtract this time interval so now we have calculated the two time intervals now we will uh, find the difference between these uh, the difference between these two time intervals so call this difference as delta t and that delta t will be equal to uh, you can subtract it from uh, t1 and t2 and the, uh, you can consider any one to be greater so let's consider that this one is subtract t2 from t1 from t2 so t2 minus t1 we are calculating so it will be equal to 2 upon c will be common in both the terms so we have l2 divided by square root of 1 minus v square upon c square and this second term is minus l1 upon uh, there is no square root so let's erase this 1 minus v square upon c square so this is the time interval uh, the time lag between the two beams reaching at this point and because of this time difference uh, there will be some change in the phase of the waves 
you must have read about this suppose that this is a wave and another wave is is not in a wave can be in phase with another wave or out of phase with some other wave so these two waves can interfere constructively while this can create uh, reduce the the amplitude of the wave so uh, a constructive and a destructive interference is like this in constructive the two crest are uh, just one above the other and in a completely destructive interference the waves one of the of the crest is with the trough of the another wave so in this way interference happens so uh, while returning from the reflection of the two mirrors these uh, light waves are uh, not matching in their phase and because of that we are observing some interference pattern now if this one experiment has been done we will rotate this whole setup including the source the mirrors and this telescope which is lying on a table by a rotation of 90 degree so in that case this v will be like this this v now this v will be parallel with this line so for that case we are we will calculate delta t prime t2 will be t2 prime and t1 will be t1 prime and the situation will be opposite because now uh, now the uh, ether is moving parallel to this l2 so these two terms must swap so you can check this that this t2 and t1 terms will be like this we have l2 because we are calculating t2 but now you know that the parallel term was having no square root and the perpendicular term is having a square root so now t2 is being parallel so it will be having no square root 1 upon v square upon c square and the another term which is for l1 we will be having the square root which is 1 minus v square upon c square so the situations for the two of the mirrors just change so we will not we can just directly write the uh, the terms for this case in which the ether is moving parallel to this l2 line segment so when you rotate the whole setup you will observe or you expect some change in the interference pattern because uh, there is uh, the time intervals this delta t prime and delta t can be different so let's calculate by uh, how these two time intervals are uh, are different from each other so just take a difference of these two terms delta t prime minus delta t and see what happens so if you calculate this this will come out to be uh, because the, both the terms contain this 2 by c just write this 2 by c and now you are subtracting delta t prime delta t from delta t prime so from this term this term will be subtracted or you can see uh, write it like that these two terms have the same denominator so this l2 and minus of minus l1 will give you l1 and it will 1 minus v square upon c square and the other term you have this minus thing and from that uh, this term will be subtracted 
from this negative term this term will be subtracted so it will be having a negative so both terms will be having a negative sign so collectively we can write it as l1 plus l2 upon under root 1 minus v square upon c square so you can take out the l1 plus l2 term so l1 plus l2 is taken out this is not 2 this is c so you have 2 l1 plus l2 divided by c and uh, this term 1 minus v square upon c square to the power minus 1 minus this 1 minus v square upon c square to the power minus half the square root will, will give you a half power and because it is in the denominator it will become minus half so here you can use the binomial formula which is uh, 1 plus x to the power n is equal to 1 plus nx where x is much much less than 1 so this v is much much less than c so v square upon c square must be less than 1 so we can uh, apply this binomial approximation this is approximately equal to 1 plus nx so this delta t prime minus delta t comes out to be 2 upon c l1 plus l2 into 1 plus v square upon c square this minus will be multiplied with this minus and again you have minus sign and there will be 1 minus this will become plus half v square upon c square you will get in this mind one term will be cancelled out and you will get 2 upon c l1 plus l2 into these two terms subtracted will be giving you v square upon 2c square so this 2 will be cancelled out and finally you get the answer l1 plus l2 upon c into v square upon c square so this is the difference of the times and you must write with an approximation because we have applied approximation in both the terms so you you know that if the the optical path difference between the two uh, beams changes by the wavelength lambda the there must be a, a, a change shift in the uh, fringe uh, by one fringe so if there is some appreciable shift in the number of fringes through the crosshairs of the telescope then we must say that there must uh, by rotating the telescope uh, a part difference uh, the optical part difference must have introduced by rotating this whole setup and this can only be possible because of the presence of ether and if the if we do not observe any shift in the fringe pattern then we can say that uh, the velocities are not uh, subtracting or adding like c minus v or v minus uh, or c plus v these things are not appearing because uh, there is no ether so by measuring the number of fringe shifted through the crosshairs of the telescope we can estimate that uh, that we can estimate the presence of ether so this uh, what we have calculated is the uh, change in the 
time intervals in which uh, we observe the interferometer in its two positions or in two configurations so if we divide this time interval by the uh, the time interval of the frequency of light so what we will get so let's do this so so del so this difference of time l1 plus l2 upon this v square this c and this c square you can better write it as c cube divided by divided by the time period of one oscillation of light wave this must give you the the number of fringe shifted because uh, this time interval is the time for one complete oscillation and this time gap between the two uh, two experiments uh, which had been done in the two configuration one before rotating and after rotating and this is the difference of that time so this can result into the um, the shift of fringes so uh, like suppose that there have been uh, 10 shift of fringes so it, so this gap represents that uh, the time interval is 10 times so if uh, if we divide this this time gap by the time interval of light wave you should get some change in the num you should get some number and that number must be the number of fringe shift through the courses so let's just divide this l1 plus l2 upon ct into v square upon c square equals delta n this is the total time and this is the time taken for one fringe so uh, one wavelength uh, so this is uh, this must give you delta n now you have this ct term now ct term can be found from this c this t into v is what it is lambda so just replace uh, now we are using not c, v but c so this ct term must be equal to lambda so we will write it as replace this ct by lambda into v square upon c square and this gives you delta n so now we can just uh, uh, approximate that this length l1 and n2 are approximately equal if if we had taken this l1 and l2 to be equal then this l1 plus l2 will become twice take this as l so it will be twice l upon lambda into v square upon c square this will be equal to delta n so uh, we now have the final formula this delta n is the number of fringes moving past the crosshairs as the pattern shift we rotate the interferometer and uh, the pattern there is some shift in pattern so number of fringes uh, through a crosshair move and we we count the number of fringes moving past the crosshairs and if uh, we notice that there are there is uh, a fringe shift of suppose that you notice that five fringes have shifted so we can conclude that there must be a, a change in the difference of the uh, optical part difference 
there must be a change in the optical part difference by 5 lambda so uh, for if optical part difference changes by lambda the shift uh, of fringe must be by 1 so in a uh, in, in the experimental setup in one of the setup this l1 and l2 were 22 meter the sum uh, you can take it them to be equal and in the experiment it was 11 meters so the sum is 22 meters uh, we are taking uh, yellow light whose wavelength is 5.5 .5 into 10 to the power minus 7 meters and the earth moves with an approximate value velo uh, speed of 30 km per second so you can calculate uh, it that v by c this will be equal to uh, 30,000 meter per second and if you divide with the velocity of light so this is 3 into 10 to the power 4 divided by 3 into 10 to the power 8 you must get 10 to the power minus 4 meter in very known unit so you get 10 to the power minus 4 so if we put all these things in the formula delta n will be equal to uh, 22 upon uh, 5.5 into 10 to the power minus 7 into 10 to the power minus 4 whole square you will get 0 0.4 so we can clearly see that this 0 0.4 uh, is even less than 1 so there is no appreciable change in the fringe pattern while we rotate the uh, this setup so we can say that uh, there is no uh, appreciable uh, amount of uh, of path difference uh, introduced by rotating this uh, whole setup so there is no ether present so this uh, this zero the, if ether was there if ether had been present then this uh, delta n must be much much greater than this uh, 0 0.4 value so we will discuss about this uh, the actual setup of michelson and morley in our next lecture in which we will discuss the uh, the paper uh, which was published in the american journal in 1818 number 1887 by michelson and morley and how they conducted this experiment because this is a very simple setup uh, but the actual experiment is uh, is based on this setup but is it is uh, much complicated than this simple setup and we will see uh, the results of that experiment and how they predicted this uh, they uh, they predicted that they failed to detect any ether so in the next lecture we will be discussing the uh, 1887 michelson model experiment paper please like our video share our video and subscribe to the channel and thanks for watching